fame, success, wealth, goals for which the majority of humanity seek after. We strive to be accepted, admired, and looked up to. But once in a while, someone stands out. Someone who says no when others urge them to say yes. Someone who turns and walks a road that others tell them cannot be trod. What makes a person do this, even to his own hurt or loss? They call it conviction, an unshakable belief which cannot be persuaded otherwise. In 1902, in the city of Tianjin, northern China, a second son was born to James and Mary Little, a dedicated and hard-working missionary couple from Scotland. They named the boy Eric Henry Little. My maternal grandparents were missionaries in China for the Presbyterian Church from Canada, and my paternal grandparents were missionaries in China from the Congregational Church. Congregational Church in Scotland, and they went out through the London Mission. Internal turmoil uh, was sort of generic uh, to China in that time. Uh, politically, uh, militarily, it was just very unstable. And in the early, around 1900, uh, there was a strong anti-Western movement that came to be known as the Boxer Rebellion. And it was a group of people who essentially, they believed that if they chanted certain words and did certain things, that they could not be harmed by bullets, knives, or any other thing, they were immortal. It was not strictly anti-Christian, it was anti-Western, anti-European. Uh, it was due to uh, the rise of Chinese nationalism and a feeling that the Westerners were taking advantage of the Chinese people. But this was a very violent group and they, their goal was to get the Westerners out of China. They burned uh, schools, businesses, homes, churches. Uh, they killed a number of missionaries. They killed far more Chinese Christians than they did Western missionaries, but this caused a, a great deal of uh, upheaval and chaos. The Boxer Rebellion uh, caused Eric's father and mother to have to leave the mission station where they were uh, in Mongolia. Uh, they went for a time to Shanghai, which was relatively safe. Eric's older brother, Rob, was born in Shanghai in 1900 and then they relocated to the city of Tianjin. Eric spent his, basically his first five years uh, in a rural mission station at Shaozhang in the countryside. And when he was about five years old, it was time for his father's first furlough. When they returned to Scotland, uh, the Littles had three children, Rob, Eric, and their younger sister, Jenny. I'm sure it was a little strange when they arrived in uh, the Green Hills of Scotland, which was completely unlike the North China Plain. But there was also a great deal more freedom that they had as boys to just roam around and explore and do things on their own. When they were in China and lived in Shaozhang, they had to stay inside the walled compound because it was simply unsafe for them to be outside on their own. And they spent about uh, a year there. And at the end of that year, as was customary for missionaries in the London Missionary Society, they planned to leave Rob and Eric in boarding school, a place called the School for the Sons of Missionaries just outside London. And this was very difficult for Eric's mother. Um, even though it was the accepted practice in their mission, uh, she dreaded it and uh, she just could hardly bring herself to do that. The plan, the standard procedure uh, for missionaries with the LMS is that they only saw their children when their furlough came up, and that was once every seven years. They were they both grown up in missionary families where there was great sacrifice, um, and, and it, you just expected it. 
like in my father's case as a child um, you know he and his brother born in China and uh, at six they had to leave their children and not see them for seven years I mean, incredible sacrifice I think for my grandmother that was very very hard and so they were educated at Eltham College you know just outside of London here and um, and they saw them every seven years. I never picked up the idea that Rob and Eric resented being left in boarding school by their parents. Um, even though I'm sure the separation was difficult, Mary Little wrote them a letter every week. And also it was school policy that the boys wrote their parents a letter every week. It didn't have to be lengthy, but at least it had to be a letter. And I think it was usually done in a situation where on a Saturday morning it was time for everyone to write the letter and you didn't get to go out and play until the letter was completed. So there was motivation to get it done. The next time Eric saw his parents, he was 12 years old. His parents and sister, along with new brother Ernest, returned to England for a rest from their labors in China. As one can expect, it was a treasured time, but the visit went by rather quickly. Twelve months later, as the boy's family once again returned to their work in China, Rob and Eric remained in school. When Eric and Rob were at Eltham College, they had the annual sports days, and both Rob and Eric were gifted athletes. They were fast on the track, they were good at cricket uh, and at rugby, and uh, as they became teenagers, the uh, annual placement in the sports days looked like an all-little sports day. It, Rob and Eric would sort of alternate taking first in different events. During their time at school, Rob and Eric began to show exceptional athletic ability. When he was 16, Eric was named Senior Athletic Champion and was awarded the school trophy. He became the captain of both cricket and rugby, and the record show one year in which both boys were the only names in first and second place of six athletic events. In fact, Eric set a new record at the school for the 100 yards, coming in at 10.2 seconds. Returning seven years later, it was no small surprise that Eric's parents would not find two boys waiting for them at the train station, but rather two young men. Rob was now 21 years old and Eric 19. Both of them were now students at the Edinburgh University. When Eric was at the University of Edinburgh, he was involved in track meets, all the athletics as they called it uh, in Scotland at the time, and he also liked to play rugby because he had played rugby at Eltham College. And so he began to play for the Edinburgh University team. There was a Scottish national team. It was still an amateur team, but it was the representative of the country in a series of international rugby matches. And they would play against uh, England, Wales, and France. And it was a great honor to be chosen for the international rugby team. He was uh, wing three quarter in the Scottish international team between 1922 and 1923, played seven times for Scotland. And he was more than just a runner, he was, well, one can imagine, he was a wholehearted guy and he went into it with great gusto. Um, and somebody said, well, when you were tackled by Eric Little, you remained t tackled. You know, it wasn't as though he was a runner who shipped doing that sort of thing. Um, but uh, as far as his athletics was concerned, he, he, just, he just was so out on his own in Scotland. He swept the boards from when he first started running and he had to be cajoled into running in 1921 at University Sports. From that time on in Scotland, uh, he, he dominated any athletic meeting he was in. Eric was participating in track and rugby concurrently, but as he began to develop more as a runner, and with the, with the Olympics looming in Paris in 1924, uh, it was felt that if he uh, wanted to try for the Olympics, 
that playing rugby was probably not smart because it was a very, uh, it was basically a blood and mud sport and uh, injury was uh, very common. So after uh, two years of playing on the international team uh, in 1923, he played his last rugby matches and uh, it was time to just concentrate on running. So he would go down to uh, a place in, Powder, uh, in Edinburgh known as Powder Hall where uh, they also had greyhound races. So you had the dogs and the men working out at the same time, I think. And there was a trainer there named uh, Tommy McKercher, or as the Scots would say, Tommy McKerker. And uh, he noticed Eric running, and he was involved in helping to train the Edin Edinburgh University team. So he po began to point out some things that Eric was doing wrong. Um, and really took him under his wing, and uh, as Eric's running developed, he really became Eric's personal trainer. He began breaking records on a regular basis. There were often track meets in which he finished first in the 100, the 220, and the 440. Uh, and, you know, his, uh, the triple crown was uh, often what he ended up with. Eric Little had an unusual running style. Uh, his knees pumped very high up toward his chest. His arms sort of rotated like a windmill. And then as he neared the finish line, he would characteris characteristically throw his head back with his mouth open and looking at the sky would grow, go across the finish line. And everyone thought it was just impossible for him to, to win anything with this unorthodox style. But he was fast. And it's interesting that uh, Tommy McCarricker didn't try to train that out of him. He tried to help relax his muscles, make sure that he was loose, that he was ready to run, but he never tried to change his style. There's a quote that I dug up from the Glasgow Herald in 19, the, the autumn of 1921, saying that Eric Little might even develop into an Olympic hero. That was after the first season that he'd been running. Uh, it was obviously recognized that he was an unusual talent. At one point during this time, Eric felt he wanted to be of service to God, but he had no idea how. His strong points were his athletic ability, his speed on the track, but that, he felt, was about all. He had no idea how God could use those gifts, but regardless, he placed them and himself entirely at God's disposal. About the time that Eric was uh, completing his education, at the University of Edinburgh. He traveled to uh, the town of Galashiels for a track meet, and there he met a young man named uh, Loudon Hamilton. And uh, Hamilton was involved with uh, a group of people who were uh, very serious about their Christian faith. They emphasized a relationship with Jesus Christ, and uh, knowing him, and talking to the Lord, uh, just as you would talk to a friend. And they were also uh, very keen on studying the Bible and uh, applying it to their lives and following, try and following the, the discipline of uh, the four absolutes in their life. Absolute purity, absolute unselfishness, absolute honesty and absolute love. And uh, uh, Eric was intrigued by this. And uh, this group at that time had no name. It later became known as the Oxford Group Movement. And it was a great source of strength and help to Eric uh, from that point on in his life. One thing that the Oxford Group emphasized was having a time each day uh, they called it a quiet time, to be alone with God. And during that time, uh, a person would read a portion from the Bible, would talk to the Lord in prayer, but then would also simply be silent, uh, seeking to listen to what the Lord would say to them and uh, how the Lord would direct them for that particular day. This became a lifelong practice of Eric Little, he would begin each day with this quiet time, early in the morning, many times when no one else was awake, uh, to read a portion of the Bible, 
to pray and to be quiet and listen to the Lord. Keeping up with his studies and athletics was a challenge, and one which Eric enjoyed. But as his popularity grew, Eric was faced with a challenge of a different kind. D.P. Thompson was a very energetic, enthusiastic divinity student at Glasgow University. He was training to become a minister. And he was also a member of a student evangelistic team that held meetings in various places on weekends and during the school holidays. And they were holding meetings at a little coal mining town not far from Edinburgh. And they were having difficulty interesting the coal miners and coming to hear these young students speak about Christianity. And D.P. Thompson said, why don't we see if Eric Little would come and tell about his Christian experience? So he went to Edinburgh and asked him. And Eric Little said yes, even though it took him way out of his comfort zone because he was not a public speaker. He was very uneasy speaking in public. He was a shy person, quiet and reserved. But he'd also been praying about how he could serve the Lord, and he really didn't know what he could do. Uh, his gifts were athletic, not in terms of preaching. But when this opportunity came up, uh, I think his heart was, uh, was ready and open, and so he told D.P. Thompson that he would go with him, and he did. Years later, Eric would recall the event. I was faced with the biggest problem of my life. I had been asked to assist at an evangelistic campaign. But at the time, I had never addressed a public gathering. I was very reluctant about accepting the invitation. The morning after being invited, I received a letter from my sister in China, and it contained this text. Fear not, for I am with thee. Do not be dismayed, for I will guide thee. Those words helped me make my decision. And since then, I have endeavored to do the work of my master. One of the results of the meeting was that it did attract uh, a good number of coal miners in this village to come and hear him. Another result of it was that uh, a newspaper reporter picked up on the idea that Eric Little had talked about his Christian faith uh, at this evangelistic meeting, and news of that, of course, got into the press. So Eric became known more not only just as a good athlete, but uh, as one with a strong Christian faith. He felt, oh, who's going to come and listen? But uh, those, those um, times when he went to speaking, he had huge crowds, huge crowds, and it brought in people that really might not have been interested in religion as such, but more into um, sports. Let's see what this sports hero has to say. A lot of people did come to hear Eric Little speak when he began to uh, give his Christian testimony more often. They used to say that Eric's presence at any track meet was good for another 5,000 people for gate admission. But people picked up on his sincerity. Uh, he was not a good public speaker. He was not a great orator. But he was sincere. He was genuine. and. Uh, he was a top athlete. So the combination of that and the notice in the press about his first evangelistic meeting uh, did create a lot of interest on the part of people. He was often uh, very self-deprecating and humorous, and people would talk about his being so fast, and he would say, well, I got it from my Scottish ancestors who would cross the border to raid the English and then they had to run back home and he said, I've been running ever since. He spoke in uh, at boys clubs, he spoke in Ibrox football stadium and young men from all over the country flocked to actually hear what he had to say. Uh, my own view on this is that whilst D.P. Thompson had a very specific and direct influence in getting him involved in the evangelistic meetings in the 20s, began in 1923. Um, I think that the, an influence in Eric Little that has not been recognized sufficiently, I think I'm right in saying this, really is the influence of his older brother and uh, Robert. R Robert was very definite, evangelical, uh, Christian, he went to study medicine somewhat before Eric went, came up to Edinburgh, 
And uh, he also did some running, actually, uh, Robert, but not at the serious level that Eric did. But he was very committed to uh, student evangelism. And I do believe that Robert's influence on Eric was possibly even greater than D.P. Thompson's influence. While at the same time, D.P. Thompson was, I think, instrumental in getting actually involved, practically speaking, in, in, the, in the evangelistic work and these meetings after the athletics meetings and so on. Eric was uh, beginning to be seen as a favored runner for the Olympics, a possible member of the team, uh, as early as 1923. Uh, th the Olympic team selection at that time uh, was very tentative until just actually a few weeks before the games because they had a final competition and the, the roster, the final roster, was not selected until that time. But Eric was beginning to think about the Olympics. He was beginning to train for it. But when the schedule was announced, the preliminary heats for the 100 meters at which he was considered to be uh, the fastest person in the world and practically a shoe-in for a gold medal, the heats were on Sunday. And Eric said, I'm sorry, I can't compete in that event because I believe that uh, the Christian Sabbath is the Lord's day, and uh, so I can't run on that day. There was a mixed reaction. Some people applauded his conviction. Some people thought it was admirable. Other people thought that uh, he needed to bend a little bit and uh, consider the good of his country and uh, uh, one person said, well, you know, the heats aren't until the afternoon and the continental Sabbath ends at noon on Sunday. And Eric said, well, my Sabbath lasts all day, so I can't do that. I think um, increasingly young people are faced with choices that generationally somebody like me would not have been um, faced with. And the, in, because Je Eric Little came from a generation even previous to mine, um, choices that he would not have been faced with but he was faced faced with a choice that related very directly to the type of culture and time that he was growing up in and he made a very very important choice in, in terms of not running on the Sabbath. Um, youngsters nowadays would probably laugh at that type of choice but they are faced with with choices that can have much more um, and, and a much greater impact on their life uh, in, in, in terms of consequences for their life um, in the years ahead. Eric Little's decision not to run on Sunday in the Olympics uh, I think was a very easy decision to make because it was, it was simply a conviction that was a part of him. It would be like someone finding a person's wallet on the sidewalk. And a person who is committed to honesty would never think of looking inside to see if there was any money before deciding whether to try and return it to the individual. It would be simply a matter of someone has lost this, it belongs to another person, I'll do all I can to help return it. They would not go and hide and see whether it was worth stealing or not. Eric's decision not to run on Sunday was not one that he had to agonize over and pray about. Scotland had never won gold, and here was an opportunity that would make his country proud. Eric was under pressure. The pressure, however, had nothing to do with the question of what he should do. Eric was already resolved not to go back on his convictions. The pressure was that he was letting down his country. Whether or not pressure was put on the authorities in France to change the scheduling of the games, I haven't had that confirmed, and I would say that that would be unlikely. International Olympic Committee would not likely change just because one con conscientious athlete from one nation was not going to compete in an event that he might have been successful in. Um, there would have been those who would not have appreciated very much his stance. Um, there, there had been those before him who had been professing Christians and had not had the same conscientiousness about the Lord's Day. But certainly 
Eric had conscientiousness about it, and whatever pressure might have been brought to bear upon him, he wasn't going to wilt or yield on that principle. So actually, they, they worked out uh, a pretty amiable uh, compromise. Eric was planning to run the 100 meters and the 200, and when he felt that he could not run the 100 because the heats were on Sunday, uh, he remained uh, a candidate for the 200, and also he began training for the 400. Although he was not considered to be a contender for a gold medal at either the 200 or the 400 meters. Doubts about his ability on the 400 ran high. One journalist wrote, it is unfortunate that E.H. Little's religious scruples will not permit of him running on Sunday, which rules him out of the short sprint, for I am not at all confident regarding his prospects in the 400 meters. Surrounded by this gossip, Eric went to Paris. And I think there are three tremendous factors uh, in, in what he did in Paris in 1924 that make it remarkable. The first was that he was inexperienced, really. He hadn't run internationally at 440 hours, 400 meters um, previously. The second remarkable thing was the number of races he ran uh, sh shortly after one another. On the Thursday, he ran first and second rounds within a few hours. And on the Friday, he ran semi-final and final within four hours. He had never run back to back 400 meters before, two in one day, never until he went to Paris. And yet in these four races, he improved his time in every race. And it's quite remarkable. And the third remarkable thing about his success in um, Paris, I think, was that he was very disadvantaged being in the outside lane. There was a 500 meter track. Uh, there was one bend, one bend only. So they started at one straight and went round a very wide bend. But uh, he was on the outside, great disadvantage. Everything seemed to be a disadvantage in a sense. And I think that these factors make this a, ve a very remarkable performance. I think on the last day of competition in the 400 meters, uh, as Eric left his hotel in Paris to go to the stadium, uh, one of the masseurs for the British team handed him a note. Uh, and he said, I'll read it when I get to the stadium. And um, it contained uh, a verse from the Old Testament uh, that the, where the Lord says, him that honors me, I will honor also. And it was a real encouragement to Eric because there had been people who criticized him for standing true to a conviction of faith saying that he should uh, consider other people in his country. And he didn't consider it a promise from God that he would win the race, but he did consider it an encouragement that he had done the right thing. No one expected Eric to excel. As the starting gun went off, he seemed to dash ahead with great speed, but speed that would certainly not sustain him to the finish line. He would surely lag behind, surely at the last 100 yards. However, it was at this point, ahead of the other competitors, that Eric went into his then well-known stride. Putting his head back, Eric increased his pace. The crowd went wild, spectators rising to their feet. To everyone's surprise, Eric won the gold by five meters and set a new world record. The, the Olympic gold was lovely, but it wasn't the most important. And I truly, truly believe that if he had um, run on the Sunday, that he would not have got a gold medal. Because he would have sold his, for him anyway. Not for, he didn't make these judgments for anybody else. This was only for himself. Those were his beliefs and his uh, judgments. If he had sold out his principles for the gold, he would not have won it. He wouldn't have had the fire the, to do that. But this, this way, um, he was running for God. I don't think for one minute that he 
sat beside his bed or knelt beside his bed the night before and said, God, let me win a gold medal tomorrow. Um, I think for many years beforehand, he trained very, very hard. He was he was disciplined in what he was doing and he worked very, very hard at it. I'm sure, though, that having done that and have, have, having worked with his trainer, he would then have said, well, Lord, um, this is what I have to offer and I want to do my very, very best. I've done all the training, I've done all the work. I hope that you'll just give me that extra push that helps me to win. Here was a man who was a Christian and he worked out his Christianity. It affected, it had an impact on his sport. Um, it wasn't just a question of the Lord's Day, it was the whole attitude to it. Uh, he was asked by a missionary, did you ever pray that you would win a race? And um, I suppose Christians have been asked that before and since. Uh, did you ever pray that you would win a race? And he said, no, I never prayed that I would win a race, but I prayed for the athletics meetings that in these the Lord would be glorified. Eric Little returned to Scotland as a national hero. At his graduation ceremony, the university's vice chancellor, Sir Alfred Ewing, stated, Mr. Little, you have shown that no one can surpass you, except your examiners. The audience responded with laughter, and then to the delight of all present, Eric was crowned with a wild olive wreath. After he graduated, his fellow students picked him up and put him in a chair and carried him from the university and, and through the streets. There was this grand celebration, uh, there were dinners, there were banquets, uh, it, it just went on and on. Which, when you think about it, Eric Little was 22 years old when all that happened. That's a that's a pretty, uh, that could be a difficult situation for the average 22 year old to have all of this attention from media, from people, of being cheered, of being uh, honored, everyone saying how wonderful he is. Uh, but it never seemed to go to his head. It did not give him a feeling of self-importance at all. He was just, uh, he continued being the person the, that he had been before. As celebrations and congratulatory events continued throughout the weeks, D.P. Thompson was busy filling up the rest of the year with evangelistic meetings in which Eric would be speaking. Oh, after, after he won the gold medal, um, his notoriety and celebrity was increased even more. So that there were crowds of people that came to hear him whenever he spoke. It was in one of the many events in which he was honored that Eric stunned his audience. Giving an after-dinner speech, he announced his intentions of dedicating himself as a missionary teacher in China. Well, those that really knew him, it wasn't a shock. But I think a lot of others felt that he could stay in Scotland and do just as good a work, you know, get a lot of those, the youth. But uh, he felt very strongly about it. He felt that those that had worked out in China, that were out there, there as missionaries, had done so much more than he had. He said, why should I get the limelight? Um, you know, they are doing the same work, or some of them even more. And uh, his running was a gift from God, and, and it, it certainly helped him along, and he enjoyed running. And, and he enjoyed the fun of it, too. But not so that uh, you think that you're something really above everybody else. And um, his sport led him to greater things. It, it, uh, it was not the be all and end all. It certainly was not. The big thing was his work in China, his missionary work. Well, like most university students in, your, in the senior year, you keep thinking, okay, well, what do I do next? And people keep asking you, oh, what are you going to do when you finish college? So uh, he had been casting about. He wasn't sure. Uh, his brother, Rob, had already committed to go to China uh, as a doctor with the London Missionary Society. Uh, Eric was a little less sure about what he wanted to do or should do. But uh, I would think that around the time of the Olympics, uh, he had decided 
that he wanted to try being a missionary teacher in China. And uh, he had been offered a position at the uh, Anglo-Chinese College in Tianjin for a period of four years to see how it went. So after his uh, Olympic victory, it became commonly known that he was planning to uh, stay in Scotland for another year and then go to China as a missionary teacher. In 1925, when Eric Little left Scotland for China, a number of his uh, athletic teammates uh, procured a carriage minus a horse uh, which they pulled themselves and they picked him up at the place where he had been living, put him into this uh, carriage and pulled it through the streets of Edinburgh uh, to Waverley Station and then there were uh, hymns of farewell as the train pulled out with everyone singing in quite a crowd there so it was, uh, it was a great send-off for Eric and of course there are articles in the newspaper and uh, magazines about uh, his uh, finally leaving Scotland and heading for China. As Eric climbed onto the train, his last words were, Christ for the world, for the world needs Christ. Eric took up his post as chemistry teacher and overseer of sports at Tianjin where he was loved by students and faculty alike. As in Britain, Eric continued to be active in making the gospel known by organizing Bible studies, preaching, and taking advantage of sports activities to share his faith. A few years later, he met someone who would change his life in a very big way. About a year after Eric arrived in China, um, the McKenzie family returned from their furlough year in Canada and uh, bringing with them uh, Florence, who was about 15 years old at that time. And uh, over the next few years, uh, an attraction developed between Eric and Florence. She was 10 years younger than Eric was, so it wasn't like he could just sort of ask her out. And, uh, but within the missionary community, the nice thing was that there were a lot of group activities where people were together. So it was a natural time to, uh, to get to know each other. And she used to take piano lessons from my Auntie Jenny, which is my father's sister. And, uh, he, sort of, and he was also, he taught Sunday school. So they came in contact there. The funny, one of the funny parts was that uh, every time she was there for her music lesson, he used to come home for tea. Uh, I think one of the defining times was when uh, my mother was acting in a Sunday school play, and it calls for some real passion, you know. And uh, she, she, she was was a lively person. And uh, so when she played that part, Eric said to her, or my father said to her. Florence, I didn't know you had all that uh, passion in you, and I think that really piqued his interest. And finally, in 1929, he proposed to Florence. She was flabbergasted at first, but overjoyed, and she agreed. Um, their engagement was not announced officially until about six months later. But another part of that equation was that her father insisted that she get an education after high school before she could marry Eric. So she left for nurses training in Canada and they were apart for the next four years except for brief meetings. After their marriage in 1934, um, Eric and Florence had two daughters who were born in China, uh, Patricia and Heather. And their life was uh, a source of great joy for Eric, who had missed uh, living in a family home during his boyhood years. Well, I was, I was very young. Um, I was only six the last time I saw him. But I think because the years were so, they were war years, you know, they were very traumatic. And um, I remember him as being steady, fair, lots of fun. Um, and uh, uh, I remember in a little race that we had father and daughter, and uh, so we both ran, we both run, he ran, and then I had to, had to give the baton to me or something like that. And I waited for other people to catch up, you see, and, 
And he said, no, no, you, it must be fair. You know, you run, your, you do your best, you run your fastest, but you don't knock anybody else down for it. You have to be fair, but you do your very best. Always do your best, yeah. In 1937, he agreed to uh, leave teaching and to serve as a, a rural evangelist uh, back at Xiaozhang, which was the first place that he had lived with his parents uh, as a, a baby in China. Things were very uncertain uh, at that time. The Japanese invasion of China in 1937 changed everything uh, because there were rival armies and factions, and the government army and the communist army and warlords uh, competing for territory and uh, uh, Eric never knew who or what he would run into uh, on his travels as a rural evangelist uh, and pastor uh, during those two years he was working in Shaoshan. Eric returned to Scotland twice on furloughs. Uh, they hoped to spend uh, some time in Canada and then go to Scotland together but the beginning of submarine warfare by the Germans in 1939 um, created a very unsafe situation and so for the first few months Eric went to Scotland alone and then Florence and the girls joined him after that for a time. We left somewhere in the UK, I don't know where, where the port was, in a convoy and we had an escort and then in the middle of the night the escort left us and the convoy went on. And we actually, three ships in our, in our convoy went down, were torpedoed. And we spent a lot of time just standing on the decks with our life jackets on. And all the time, Heather and I never felt frightened. Um, you know, our parents were very good about keeping us feeling secure with them. And our ship was actually hit by a torpedo and it was a dud and you know to this day I can still hear all of a sudden the, the motors going bang, 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 and just we just spread out and um, there we were. Early in 1941 the situation in China was becoming more and more unstable. Uh, the war in Europe was raging uh, London was being bombed nightly by the German Luftwaffe during the Blitz. Uh, Hitler was steamrolling across Europe, seemingly unstoppable. And uh, Japan was increasing its control over North China and other parts of Asia. And then my mother found out she was pregnant with a third child. And this made... Um, well, it, it was a dilemma, you know, what to do. They finally decided that my mother and we two girls would go back to Canada and she would have the baby and wait for him. And he, because he said, I, I can't, I can't leave my people here. You know, you're working with them. You're, uh, that's your job. That's your responsibility. And we would be safe in Canada. And he couldn't just run away and leave them. So he, he stayed. Last time I saw him, he took Mother and Heather and I to the uh, ship in Japan. We got on the on the ship, and um, my mother was expecting Maureen. So he said, "Now, Patricia, I want you to be grown up and uh, look after your mother until I get back." And, you, you know, so then you think, well, I have to be grown up and I have to do this. And you do it. You know, it's expected and you don't think anything about it. They thought that maybe at the outside they might be apart for a year and then he would come home. But, of course, that all changed uh, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. Never heard a thing for nine months. And uh, I, my mother, it was extremely hard. She was very young. You know, she was still in her 20s. And, uh, but she, never did she ever think that she wouldn't see him again, you know? Um, except maybe it was one, one time. 
when my father and her were sitting by the banks of Loch Lomond and they're saying, I'll take the high road and you'll take the low road, but I'll be in Scotland before you. Yeah, me and my true love will never meet again on the bottom of the banks of Loch Lomond. So, but, uh, you know, he was so vital and so strong. Uh, she thought, if anybody can survive, he will. Before that time, the people living in North China were considered foreign nationals by the Japanese. After Pearl Harbor, they were considered enemy nationals when the United States declared war on Japan. And they were confined to the concessions in the part of Tianjin uh, where they lived, and they were not free to travel, they were not free to leave. And eventually, that led the Japanese to move these people into internment camps simply as a matter of control. Uh, they were called internment, they were called civilian assembly centers, which was a polite term for prison camp. They were not tortured, they were not harmed, uh, but it was a very difficult situation. They were placed inside a compound. They couldn't leave. They had the basic necessities of life provided to them, and then they had to figure out how to put it all together. The people in these camps um, were an incredible mixture and cross-section of life because uh, there weren't just missionaries in North China. There were business people, there were entertainers, there were tourists, there were travelers. Uh, there were people who were very devout Christians and there were opium addicts. They had to cooperate with each other. They had to pull together. They, people who had been uh, high-ranking executives uh, with multinational companies now had to chop vegetables in the kitchen. Other people had to pump water to carry coal because their very existence depended on it. I was about 14. A Japanese police came and the army and put barricades around our school property and it was something that grew slowly. They came through our school property uh, pretty rough, you know, not uh, hurting anybody but helping themselves to this and that and started measuring up everything. And it was told us that we'd be going into a Britain camp later. We became enemy nationals overnight. It was on a Monday morning uh, there, although because we were other side of the date line, it wasn't the Sunday. Uh, but uh, the children came back from school. Uh, a day or so afterwards, the Japanese soldiers arrived at the compound, took over the compound, sent the Chinese students uh, back home or sent them out of the compound, uh, sealed off the compound, uh, inquired, made, interrogated us for uh, see what we were, what we were doing and so on, searched the place for weapons and then set up a, a regime within the compound with guards at the gates that we, so that we were not able to move around without the knowledge of the Japanese. The camp had been originally a pre American Presbyterian mission compound. It was a large compound uh, which was a, a middle school, a hospital, had quite a good hospital building, and um, uh, it had a, quite a, a good-sized church there with many rooms uh, for, um, for students. There were small 9 by 12 uh, room, nine feet by twelve feet uh, rooms that uh, families were put in, and large dormitories, what had been classrooms, were used for for others. They were all bedded together. Unfortunately, between the time of Pearl Harbor and the uh, Presbyterian mission people who had been running it uh, had gone. And the time that we arrived, it had been used as a, an army barracks by the Japanese who had just trashed the place. And so uh, most of the furniture, most of the cooking equipment and so on was in a very bad state. Most uh, prominently was the state of the sewerage. 
and um, the uh, sewers had all become blocked up. And within two or three days of our arrival there, in fact, they overflowed suddenly. Instead of just a few hundred troops, there were 1,800 people. Uh, and uh, so ways had to be found of dealing with it. Oddly enough, the people who set about dealing with it in a very practical way without asking for any decision on the part of any kind of authority were a group of Roman Catholic priests uh, and Roman Catholic fathers who had been taken out of their monasteries and sent to camp. And they set about digging trenches and doing all that was necessary to make the sewerage system work. It was a very large camp with a variety of types of people, all ages from babies to 80 and 90 year old people, many nationalities. And uh, we kept camp life going by doing chores. Uh, there was a labour department that gave us jobs that we had to do as our contribution to the community life. I was working in a kitchen feeding 700 people. There were 1,500 people in the camp and they were in three different kitchens and I had to stir a big cauldron uh, with, with uh, bread porridge, bread soup, bread everything. You just thought about food all the time and so it, uh, you're hungry a lot of the time. I remember all my teeth, every one of my teeth was loose uh, by the time uh, at the end. Uh, but at the same time, we we accepted it as, you know, just part of life. In the camp at Wei Shen, where Eric Little uh, was, there were uh, families, of course. Many people had their children with them. And uh, after a few months, there was a group of mostly Canadians that were repatriated. They got to go home because they were part of a prisoner exchange. And they were replaced in the camp by a group of 300 children and teenagers from uh, the China Inland Mission School at Chifu. Most of these were children of missionary parents and um, they were separated from their parents because they had simply been at school, a kind of a, a boarding school in China. Uh, and so Eric uh, really uh, had a great deal of sympathy and compassion uh, for these children and teenagers and he invested a lot of his time and work uh, with them. About the second day I was in camp, somebody pointed this man out to me and said, uh, uh, he ran for the Olympics. This is the man who wouldn't run on a Sunday. And we, then we knew who he was. And he was very friendly. He was all over the camp, cheering people up and asking questions. And he was particularly good to the Chifu scholars whom he knew were separated from their parents by many provinces. And he himself was missing his family, so he was very, very good to the chief of children. I was one. I had heard him as someone being a far off, kind of a star somewhere up there, <laughs> um, one that I would never meet, but it was just a name to conjure with, to find him suddenly that I was living alongside him and later, very shortly afterwards, living in the same dormitory with him across the other side of the, the dormitory uh, was, uh, took some getting used to. <laughs> well, he was a man of prayer and a man of uh, commitment to the Christian faith. And Eric Little and um, several others shared quiet times together in the morning, unburdened themselves to each other, discussed passages of the scriptures. Eric continued his quiet times uh, in camp in very crowded conditions. They, they didn't have private rooms, uh, especially among single people. There would probably be at least four to six people to a room. And Eric would get up early in the morning and have a small peanut oil lamp, which he would light. And one of his roommates, uh, Joe Cottrell, uh, noticed him getting up early and, and lighting this lamp to read uh, his Bible and have a time of prayer and Joe was used to doing that so they became sort of silent quiet time mates uh, each morning together. It was that experience 
that I look back upon as being one that kept me on an even keel during the days in internment. But Eric had a firm foundation in his not only his knowledge of the Bible, but his appreciation and his attitude to Bible teaching. Eric's attitude in much of what he said was not the kind of hot gospeling attitude which would go out and ask people if they were saved, but it was that the ultimate aim of preaching, of reading the Bible, of prayer, was to bring about a change within oneself, an internal change, a change in one's attitude to God, in one's attitude to other people. Uh, the one word that comes out from much of what Eric said and what came over time and time again is that simple Christian word, love. Later on, I was able to dis I did describe him as the most Christ-like man I've ever met. Not that he was Christ-like in a kind of niche, but in the same way that Jesus Christ was a person of the world. He lived the kind of life that everyone else lived. So did Eric. But there was this added point that he loved everyone. He sought to love everyone and sought to show the love of God to everyone. He was very good with teenage Bible studies. I, um, I remember Stephen Metcalf talking about the he had story uh, Bible studies on the Sermon of the, on the Mount and how he brought that out so so clearly to be applicable to now as teenagers in a Japanese internment camp. He was not a, a classical kind of preacher. Uh, where in, in in school the sermon should have a beginning and ending and three points or four points, many illustrations and so on. Instead, Eric talks were talks uh, as though he were talking to you individually, just speaking of problems he he met with and how he approached God in prayer uh, in his life, in his Bible reading to come through those situations and how in all situations we are seeking to uh, bring the gospel of God's love to all people. As I say, it was, as it were, a talk rather than a sermon. And that's what I mean in technical terms. He was not a good preacher, but everyone loved to listen to him because he was speaking to people uh, at the level they could understand and uh, with an authority one felt uh, that came from a life lived in contact with God. Uh, Dean Hubner put up, a, he put up, a, he made it of wood, uh, a sign on the on the doorway of their dorm, and it said, Uncle Eric is, and it was in or out, and Eric had to, if he were going out, he'd slide it across to say out, so that they weren't bothered by <laughs> Lots of, say, knocking on the door and say, Is Uncle Eric here? We, if we wanted to talk about anything, we went to Uncle Eric to talk about it. <laughs> I mean, problems of, of teenage living, I guess. He was always there for us. Among the missionary community, uh, adults were always known as aunt and uncle. Uh, it was just the way missionaries addressed the, uh, uh, the people, at, uh, the adults in their lives. Uh, in the case of Eric, uh, when they called him Uncle Eric, it probably became more than just a standard term because he was available to talk with uh, the teenagers. Um, he was teaching chemistry because school went on and uh, they didn't quit having school, they just found people who could teach. So he was involved with them in, they really had no place for classrooms, but uh, tutoring individually and in small groups. He refereed sports games. He helped organize athletic activities. Uh, he gave talks to the group. And uh, he was always repairing the equipment during the evening hours uh, after it's being broken during the games of the day. There's a story that's told about uh, Eric observing uh, a group of students who were, I don't know, playing field hockey or, or some sport uh, on a Sunday afternoon 
and there was no one to referee the games, and it sort of disintegrated into a conflict and a fight uh, among them. And uh, even though Eric had very strong convictions about keeping the Sabbath, uh, he agreed to referee their games on a Sunday afternoon, uh, simply because he felt that this was a need that existed in uh, a way that uh, he should help and encourage them. And he came to the feeling that it was the Christian, the Christ-like thing to do, to let them play with the equipment and to be with them. You know, not in church time or anything, but to be with them the times he could. Um, because it, it was more Christ-like to do it than to, to do the letter of the law and let them uh, run amok by themselves. So he did change on that. And for me, that was very interesting because it was the one thing, of course, everybody remembers about Eric. But his, his Christian faith was very pertinent to the time and the place and now. How do we live Christ now in our situation? I think the main problem was, how long are we going to be here? This is going to go on for a long time. And he would come around and assure us that God had everything in control. It was the biggest camp in China, you know. And uh, uh, really, they left us to run ourselves, and unless you you know, really cross swords with them, you weren't likely to get a bad time. If you're caught in the black market, you were locked up for perhaps a week or two. There were mothers with babies needing eggs for their children and so on. And uh, we, our main food was bread. And so this Catholic priest who went to Peking later, um, he did a lot of work over the over the fence, and they brought it through the electrified wires. And then we had these Chinese coolies who brought in the, who came in and cleared the night soil, and they came with um, messages stuffed up their nose, which told us about the war coming our way. And as they went past a certain uh, rubbish dump. They used to blow their nose into the rubbish dump. Uh, only two people knew about it, and afterwards they'd go out and uh, pick up the silk, and then it would go up on the notice board to say, uh, <laughs> the rumor for today is that uh, Okinawa has fallen, or S Saipan, or something like that, you see. And uh, the Japanese were certain that we had uh, radio somewhere and they're always searching but never found it because we didn't. But uh, that's how the news came in to us. Because they had no textbooks in camp for the school, uh, Eric created a chemistry textbook from memory. And he wrote out different experiments and uh, pictures and diagrams of a certain kind of apparatus and said if you take this substance and add this substance there will be a reaction, describe what happens. And so all of their laboratory work was uh, by way of imagination. But it's an amazing book when you look at it. It's just uh, all of these various uh, experiments and pictures and diagrams and uh, all created out of his head in order to uh, help these students learn their chemistry. Yeah, he, he was desperately busy. And he did a lot of things like carrying coal for this person, that person who couldn't carry coal. He's just one of these people who, you know, some people see what needs to be done and did it. That was the type of man he was. He, he was discussing whether you really could love the Japanese guards here and the Japanese, you see. Uh, was it really practical? And uh, we discussed it, and I remember it was Matthew 5, and the last verse is, 
be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we decided that it was a goal to be aimed at, you see, to love your enemies. And he smiled and he said, uh, I thought so too, but he said, then I realized that it says, uh, love your enemies, pray for those who despitefully use you. And he, he said, well, we spend a lot of time praying for the people we like, and we spend no time at all praying for the people we don't like. And he challenged us to pray for the Japanese. He said, I get up every day and pray for the Japanese. And uh, he, you know, challenged us. I started praying for the Japanese at that time. That was where my interest in Japan, everything started. And my shoes had worn out. And one day he came over to me and he had I forget whether they're wrapped up in a cloth or what, but he said to me, Steve, I see you have no shoes and it's winter. And uh, he said, perhaps you can use these for two or three weeks. Get about two or three weeks wear out of them. And just with a nod, he pushed them into my hands and I opened them up. and. Uh, they were his running shoes, but he didn't, they weren't spikes, you know, but they're his running shoes. And uh, it wasn't till later that I really thought, well, those shoes had a lot of significance in his mind. But at any rate, he had tied them up with string and tied the soles up and so on. Put a lot of work into it just to give them to me. Toward the end of 1944, uh, one of Eric's roommates uh, told me that he began to notice that Eric's speech was a little bit slower. Um, he wasn't quite as sharp in his exchange, his humorous exchange and the repartee that they had enjoyed before. And then Eric became, uh, started complaining about these severe headaches that he would, was having. And I know Eric worked on the pump for a while. He had to pump all the water from a well and uh, he would, uh, you know, you'd come up and then down and up and then down just for three hours at a time, pumping the water for the camp. And uh, I remember actually when he felt that his memory was going and he told me <laughs> that in order to stimulate his memory, uh, he had a book, he used to memorize long portions of scripture, whole chapters of scripture, but he decided he would learn the last three chapters of A Tale of Two Cities, prose, uh, you know, where, where um, the one man stands in for the other man and goes to the guillotine instead of the man with a family. And he says it is a far, far better thing I do than ever I have done before. And so he learned those last three chapters of, of uh, A Tale of Two Cities. And he learned it on the, when he was working on the pump. It would come up and the book was on the ground. So when he went down with the handles, he would read a line and come back and say it and learn the whole of the three chapters because he felt his, he felt his memory was going. In fact, it was Annie Buchan who had been nursing uh, a missionary, no, nursing someone in Peking who had died, and then she was brought into camp uh, after that. Uh, and her, one of her early remarks was that uh, Eric seems to be slowing down. Well, we didn't pay much attention to that because so were we all slowing down. Our intake of food was uh, was getting less and less. I mean, Annie Buchan was a a. Uh sprightly little Scotswoman uh, with a lot of courage who had uh, served as a nurse in China for many years. And uh, she was uh, a very independent, uh, opinionated uh, uh, young woman with great, of great courage who served in many difficult situations. And uh, she found herself uh, sent to Weishin camp uh, 
at one point. Uh, she had known Eric and Rob, and she'd actually uh, worked with Rob at, uh, at the Xiaozhang Hospital for a time. They first of all thought that it was um, uh, nervous exhaustion. He was involved with the young people who's involved. He was very busy in running sports activities for young people. And they at one point suggested that he should give that up and go into the bakery to in, in, get involved in much more physical activities rather than ones that uh, kept him alert to the needs of other people and contact with other people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and uh, so he, uh, uh, well, we began to notice these changes in him. But at the turn of the year, he began to find difficulty in walking and lost the use of, not completely lost the use of his limbs, but found it difficult to walk up and down the, uh, uh, the dormitory there. And finally, he went into the hospital. They weren't quite sure what was going on. They thought it might be some kind of exhaustion, a slight nervous breakdown. He got a little bit better uh, in the hospital for a while and was out, but then had to go back in. And the doctors began to suspect that it could be a brain tumor, but they had no x-ray equipment in order to verify it. Visiting hours were at 11 o'clock. And uh, I had my book, the book he wrote with me. I'd had my quiet time that morning and I just went to see him. In fact, he has a Red Cross letter to his wife and uh, um, it says, Joyce Stranks has been great of great help to me, bringing me all the news. <laughs> and so I used to go every day and tell him what was going on in the camp. And also, he we'd talk about what I had read. And I was sitting beside Eric's bed, and we were talking. And um, we were talking about the third chapter in, in his book that he had written um, about the surrender of our will to the will of God, so that in everything we did, in our attitudes, it was not what we wanted to do and what we felt like doing, but what God wanted us to do and to surrender that, that will that we all have to him. And we were talking about that. And he, he started to say surrender. He said, surrender. Seren, and then his head went back. Joyce ran to get the nurse, Annie Buchan, who in her uh, way uh, sort of uh, uh, criticized Joyce for visiting him. She should, you shouldn't have been here anyway. And uh, of course, Joyce was very upset. And, and I was, I just panicked. And I, I um, ran out and found Annie Buchan, Miss Buchan, we teenagers. and. Uh, called her and uh, she 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 said you shouldn't have been in there anyway she said to me because it was before visiting hours it was just before 11 but um she came in and she pulled the curtains around his bed and then she came out and she i was crying and um uh, she shook me and said, what did he say? What did he say? And I said, he said, surrender. And uh, she said, oh. The people in the camp were devastated by Eric Little's death. He was one of the few people who bridged the gap between the business community and the missionary community. They were two different groups that that didn't have a lot of appreciation for each other. Uh, the business community often looked on the missionaries as being separate and judgmental, and uh, the missionaries looked at the business community as being exploiting the Chinese for their own ends and that kind of thing. So they didn't get along very well. But Eric was, was sort of beyond that or above it, and uh, he moved freely among both groups. It was a cold day. It had been snowing. I was at the door when they, when I was given the job of helping to 
carry the coffin down to the cemetery. And uh, the church had been crowded with people of all kinds, Christian and non-Christian. I remember walking back absolutely shattered, you know. It was just, it was really a sh shattering experience to feel that a man like this had, you know, that nothing uh, that was expected had happened, as it were. And here he was, only 43 years old, and he's gone. I was pretty depressed about the whole thing. And it was due, after that that I told God that uh, uh, if I survived in the prison camp, I'd go to Japan as a missionary. The day after he died, um, when the news went around the camp, one found grown men who had, uh, I don't think they shed a tear for the last 50 years, were in tears at his death because he was known not because of his Olympic uh, prowess, but because he was Eric. He was the kind of person who was a friend to everyone. And his, his uh, funeral bore that out. The church wouldn't hold all the people, but um, the church was full. And then the route from the church to the, uh, to the graveyard in the Japanese part of the compound uh, was lined with the camp and the whole camp closed down and it was a very, very moving occasion. My dad and Annie Buchan took me to this, it was a little shed that Annie had laid him out very lovingly. And I remember seeing him there, very peaceful. And I remember thinking, he's not here. He's just not here. And I, I it was comforting in a way because I knew he had gone to be with the Lord he loved so well. I believe one man who was not a Christian uh, said of Eric that uh, Jesus Christ used to live in our camp, but he died yesterday. And I think at that point the thoughts of many people were of course with his wife and three children back in Canada who weren't to hear about it for several months. We lived in Toronto at the time, and um, I was just a little girl. Uh, I was in the kitchen, saying to my mother, I said, Mother, you look so beautiful today. I mean, she was, she was lovely. And, she, and I said, but you look so different. And she's just, she was just glowing. And she said, you know what, Tricia? I think your father's coming home. She said, because I can feel him. I've felt him for at least, I, I don't know how long, it was about a week. She said, I feel him right here. And I feel if I turn my head a little quicker, I will see him. And he's saying to me, it's all right, Laurel, it's all right. And uh, <laughs> that was about, just about a week before um, she got the letter, the telegram came to somebody else in the higher up and to say that he was dead. And he had died in um, February and I mean she just uh, couldn't believe it but she said you know he was he was there he was telling me it's all right so, yeah and and, and uh, the, the day that we got the uh, uh, <laughs> the letter I had been at a, in a race at school, and Heather and I were really good at, at running, you know, so we just liked to be like Daddy and run fast. And, and so I came ra roaring into the house saying, guess what, guess what, I won this and won that. And, <laughs> and uh, everything was quiet. I mean, they just, um, uh, there didn't seem to be anybody around. The little doors were closed, and, and that's when... Um, my mother and uh, we three girls had a little sort of apartment up on the third floor, two bedrooms, that's where, those were our special places. And that's where she told us that he had died. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the whole world changed them for us. His youngest daughter, Maureen, who had been born in Canada uh, and had never seen her father 
would never see her father and never know him. And even Heather, who had just really baby memories of him, um, and for Patricia, uh, suddenly all that they had been hoping for and anticipating, and the war was really beginning to come to an end. It was almost the time of, of VE Day, victory in Europe, and then uh, there was hope that it would soon be over and they would be reun reunited. And, uh, and then this came, and it was just uh, one of those things that uh, leaves you reeling for a good bit of time. We had a notice on the board. The rumor for today is that uh, the Americans, American B-29 has dropped an atomic bomb on uh, Hiroshima. Now this was a lot of detail in that, you see. Everybody was talking about it. Hiroshima, you know, they knew that detail and that it was a B-29. We'd never heard of B-29s. <laughs> and <laughs> an atomic bomb, that was something, you know, we'd never heard about and so on. But, um, and that the emperor had announced that the war was over. That was on August the 15th, I think. And on the 16th, uh, on the night of the 15th, we demonstrated outside the uh, commandant's grounds. And we all sh shouting, is the war over? And he came out and in very broken uh, English, he said, I don't know if the war is over or not. We were used to Japanese planes. We knew them well, knew the sound of them. But this one we didn't know the sound of, and it was quite high up, and it circled round, and it came down lower over the camp. And we looked up at it. It seems to me that all 1,800 people did it at the same time. We looked up and saw the stars and stripes on the underside of the wing. I will never forget. I can see it to this day. And. Everybody went mad in the camp. They just started crying and they all came running out into the little streets and alleys of the camp. And, and uh, the, the airplane went and pulled higher and we thought it was going away. And people were weeping. And all of a sudden the door, the undercarriage opened and um, seven little puffs dropped out and we, we thought they're dropping mail. You know, we hadn't had mail for years. And um, all of a sudden, one of the bundles kicked his legs like that. And everybody said, they're men. <laughs> and these seven men had, had landed. They landed outside the camp. We had heard a lot of Japanese planes. They were a bit rattly and uh, <laughs> When this one came, it was uh, purring with, uh, with great uh, pleasure to us. And we all went and uh, waved to it. And one of the seven uh, men was a former scholar of the chief of schools. We were very proud of him. He had pulled strings to release us. The whole camp streamed out through the gate and passed. The guards protested at first, but then prudently went into the guardhouse. They must have known that the war was over, nearly over, and they put down their their arms and came out to watch the fun. But these people, ragged people, just screamed out and went into the fields and picked these men up on their shoulders and brought them in on their shoulders. When the war came to an end, we had arranged to meet play the various national anthems of the of the nationalities and I rushed back from my trombone and joined them and played with them while they, they were carrying the American officers into the camp who were waiting outside expecting the Japanese to put up a fight which they didn't do. My dad meanwhile had rushed about trying to find his band you know in all different parts of the camp my dad got the wall together. They stood near the wall, near the big gate where they were, where these 
all the rest of them had streamed out to get these people. And as they came in with them on their shoulders, my dad's band was playing. And uh, oh, playing all sorts of things like Happy Days Are Here Again and, and, uh, and the national anthems. And they went into the Stars and Stripes and the Americans slipped off the shoulders of these, of these raggedy prisoners and he saluted. And then Florence had to begin to start figuring out how they would live as a family. And she decided to return to nursing so she could support herself and her girls and try to order her schedule so that she could be there during the times of the day when, uh, when they needed her. She was uh, the same principles. Lots of fun, very fair. Lucky, we, we were so fortunate to have the parents we had. We really were. I think one of the gifts that uh, they gave us was, those were war years and my father died in a prisoner of war camp. And it would have been very easy for lots of widows to blame, you know, the country. And so that you, it, the, the hatred goes on. It, it doesn't dissipate it. And, uh, but we, we never felt any anger or um, against the Japanese at all. You know, um, that was a good. That was a great gift that she gave us. It was it was the times. It was war, and uh, you had to forgive. You just had to forgive and uh, get on with it. And so we did. And my father's fame never affected us at all because we, we grew up in Canada and uh, we were just regular people. And at the end of the war, there were lots of children who didn't have their fathers. My mother went back into nursing and um, uh, we, we just had to pull together. And we did pull together very well. You know, wherever, even when we were little, you always felt that God was walking with you. you know? I mean, he wasn't up there, fairy away. You think, right there with you and you, you can uh, life is easier that way you know? I'm not saying that you get any fewer problems because you do get the problems and you get some horrible problems and you get some horrible things tossed at you but there you know you've had ground into you that you have something stronger inside that will help you through the help you through the times Patricia perhaps more than the other two girls I think was aware of the lack of having their father in their lives as they grew up and because Patricia was the oldest and probably felt a responsibility and, and often wished that their father could have been there when times were difficult and uh, probably had a lot of doubts about why God would let something like that happen. I must say, at times as children, we said, why wasn't he with us, you know? Why wasn't he there? Because um, sometimes as a child, I would, I would, uh, you know, close my eyes and I would walk in that camp and I would look for him and I would talk to him. <laughs> but it's funny that um, about the six months before he died or a few months before, I'd walk in that camp and I couldn't find him. I couldn't find him at all. Uh, it was just one of these children's things, you know. But, uh, and it wasn't until years later that I found out, I think there maybe was a reason that he stayed in that camp. I had met a lot of the children that were in the camp, same age as we were. And they were put in the camp without their parents. Um, you know, we were safe, and these children did not have parents. And they have done, most of them have done very well. And uh, he made a great influence in the steadiness of their, of their lives there. So in that sense, you know, God's hand was there. He could have gone with them and experienced having his children around him. But uh, God had a purpose in all this. I'm sure you know the story of 
of, uh, he was traveling from Tianjin to Xiaochang and he, saw, he heard of a Chinese man uh, lying on the steps of a Chinese temple and the Japanese thought they had killed him but he had a, a cut in his, in his neck and Eric Little got him onto a cart and they pushed him to the hospital and this man stayed with a, a missionary family and he turned out to be an artist and he gave them a, a picture of, a, of, of some flowers and um, his life was greatly influenced by this kindness of Eric Little. I know through talking to individuals who knew him that that commitment to them ran very, very deep and it had a tremendous impact on them. Um, I remember hearing, for instance, Stephen Metcalf speaking about his encounters with Eric Liddell and they were long-term encounters. Um, when he was a young lad with no parents in the internment camp and who received guidance from, from this man in a very real way. And he, he spoke about his, his struggles um, with hatred for, for the Japanese who were imprisoning him and about Eric's unfailing um, commitment to believing that we should love our enemy. And out of that, you know, just the wonder of Stephen Metcalf, Metcalf's call to minister to the Japanese as a missionary after the war. I mean, there's something totally wonderful about that. There's something wonderful about the level and the depth of care that Stephen Metcalf experienced um, from Eric Liddell that would allow that kind of influence um, to be there. On my 19th birthday, it's April 44, the year before the end of the war, I had a time of prayer just near the hospital and I said to God, if you'll save my life, I'll serve you all my life in the ministry. And that's how I came. I was at that spot again this summer. On one side of me was the hospital where Eric Little had died. Behind me was a spot where my friend had been electrocuted waiting for roll call. And where I was standing was the spot where I had made this promise to God, which I had kept in my work in Africa and Zimbabwe and South Africa. Eric Little's stand for God, while he may not have realized it at the time, would have far-reaching results. My brother sent me a booklet, actually this booklet here on Eric Little. He sent me this booklet and it was very, uh, had a powerful effect on me. And that's how I came to write the articles in the Athletics Weekly, which uh, were uh, used uh, by the writer of the screenplay of Chariots of Fire and which led to my own involvement in that particular project. I think Sir David Putnam was visiting someone in Los Angeles and uh, was perhaps not feeling well for a day or so and uh, just picked up a book to read and was reading about the 1924 Olympics and saw something about Harold Abrahams and winning the 100 meters and and then perhaps a bit about Eric Little and not running on Sunday, and this captured his imagination, and he began to investigate it, and that was the genesis of the film Chariots of Fire, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1981. I think of um, one young woman, a, a beautiful young Japanese uh, lady who came to visit the, the, the center. As a youngster, she had um, been watching Chariots of Fire, and had actually converted to Christianity because of the influence that Eric Liddell had on her, her life. Eric was the product of the input of many people. Uh, his parents, uh, their interest in him, their prayers, their love for him, even though um, they felt that um, what God had called them to do as missionaries required this sacrifice of separation for much of their lives. His teachers, 
at Eltham College who inspired him in many different ways. Uh, Eric was greatly influenced by his brother Rob. And then of course Florence brought uh, a great uh, joy to him, a great completion to his life, uh, a home and a family that he'd not known when he was growing up. So uh, there's a lot of things that go into the making of every person. He just seemed to turn his back on potential, advantage, fame, and so on. But his first concern was the kingdom of God and not the temporal kingdoms. For me, it was the, the biggest awakening, the one that, that guided my life most. Because he, he made Christ's um, life so relevant to, you know, and made it feel like we who followed Christ must do what he has asked us to do where we are in, in the situation we are in. You know, you don't get a dispensation because you're in the camp. If it's only about telling, um, people feel um, that they've been failed in some way when the life doesn't match up. Uh, but Eric Liddell's life, as far as I can see through all of the reading, through all of the contacts that I've had with people who actually knew him, Eric actually lived the life. In researching and uh, writing the biography, Eric Little, Pure Gold, um, I spent a lot of time with Eric over a period of about four years. I think the thing that impressed me, uh, well, one thing was a comment by his niece, who when she was trying to describe him, paused for a minute and said, well, he was just so ordinary. Uh, he was not a flashy person. In life, he was methodical. He was a plotter. Uh, he was shy. He was reserved. Now, he had a twinkle in his eye and, uh, and a mischievous part of his personality, but the only place he was really fast was on the track. But he was genuine. And there were not two Eric Littles. There was only one. He was not one person in public and a different person in private. What you saw was what you got, anytime, anywhere. And he was sincere, and he often talked to children in Sunday school about the word sincere and about its Latin origin meaning without wax. And he would tell them the story of how uh, in ancient times uh, dishonest sculptors, if they had a piece of marble that was flawed or had a crack, would put wax in it and then polish it so that the buyer would not be aware of it. But of course, at some point, the wax would melt or crack and break, and then they would be aware that they had been cheated. And so he said, the two words without wax combine to be our modern word sincere. And we are to be genuine, true, honest, integrity. He was a person of integrity. and. People appreciated that about him in the Olympics and uh, with his stand about not running on Sunday. And he was unselfish. He was a servant of other people. And that's what he was all about. And uh, uh, again, I think that, that remark to me was so telling that he lived better than he preached. Because so many times those of us who communicate and, and work in fields where or we talk or write or make films, are always worried about our presentation, and about what we say. Whereas really the, the thing God is concerned about, I think, is how we live and who we are. He was a very humble man. He didn't think, I don't, I don't think he put any uh, things how everybody should be, you know. It was his faith, that, the way he worked. He wasn't saying, I'm this way and you should be this way at all. Not at all, not at all. Um, his faith was a simple, personal faith. And um, I think he was a very non-judgmental person. You know what I mean? Everybody's faith is for themselves to... Uh, it's, it's like not running on a Sunday. He wouldn't, if somebody else wanted to run on Sunday, that it wasn't for him to say no. 
that was purely his own um, way it was. I mean, that's the way he was raised. That was his faith. And he wasn't going to alter it. Just for a goal.